Well, um, hello everybody and uh, lovely to see so many of you joining me already, uh, which is fantastic. We are going to be drawing, oh, wrong side, this, <laughs> it's a mirror image, uh, this gorgeous little rib uh, ribbon, Robin, today. Um, and we're going to have a really, really lovely couple of hours together drawing. I'm going to try and take it a steady. Um, I know that I can go a little bit speedy at times um, and there's always there's always a place for speedy but tonight I'm going to try and make it a little bit steadier. We might not get through the whole Robin um, but what I'd love you to do is when we finish I'd love you to crack on and I'd love you to finish your Robins with the techniques and all of the information that I have um, given uh, tonight. So um, I'm just going to send Vicky a quick message. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, and um, I think I can. I think people people are saying hello, uh, which is really, really nice. I just want to just want to check that everybody, um, uh, everybody can hear me and you're all happy with the quality of the, the screen and everything like that. Um, I thought I'd come on first of all and say hello and then I'm going to dive over to my drawing board and we're going to get cracking. So hopefully you've got your pencils at the ready and uh, your robin drawn out and uh, we're going to have a really, really super, super, super evening. Um, so, hang on. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, yeah, I think we're going to get cracking. Now, if you've got any questions, please do pop your questions in the chat. Um, hopefully, amazing Vicky, who's here, is going to be able to answer some of them, but she will pass some of them through to me as well. So uh, I will be able to answer those as well. So I'm going to come to my drawing board. So just switch that off and we can see the little Robin here. Um, and we're going to start, we're going to make a start. So I'm just going to put my, I always put my visor on when I'm drawing because my lights are behind me um, and they shine in my eyes. So, um, ah, so I've got my little Robin uh, all um, drawn out here. I'm using a piece of uh, pastel mat. It's actually, it's a pastel mat sheet. So it's the, the thin sort of card with the shiny backing. Um, it's not it's kind of okay. It's not overly smooth. It's a little bit grainy, um, but um, it'll be absolutely perfect for what we're going to do tonight. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we're going to get. I think we're going to get cracking. So I've chosen sort of like a limited number of pencils, um, just so we're not overwhelmed or anything with uh, all of the sort of you know different pencils and all of that kind of stuff. And I think. It's going to come into its own with the colours I've chosen for the little red um, chest area. Oh, right, Vicky can't get on. Let me just send her a link. Hang on. That's no good, is it? Um, I'm just going to send Vicky a very quick link. Uh, copy that. So I might have to try and figure out the questions on my own <laughs> if poor old Vicky can't get on. So I'm just going to open that up as well. Um, make sure that I've got my sound off. Um, ah, there we go. That's great. And oh, hold on. Sorry about this. I'm just trying to make sure I've got all of the chat and everything up on here. Um, now then, oh, open it in the app. That was probably a better idea. There we go. Right, so I can see all of these now, uh, which is great. Okay. So, um, hopefully, oh, she's here. Vicky's here. Thank goodness. Right. Well, I've got the chat here as well, so that's good. So I can see what's um, I can see what's going on in there as well now, which is great. Okay. So let's get cracking. Um, always got a little bit of technical issues and stuff like that. Um, but um, uh, yeah. Okay. Let's get cracking. We're going to start off with with the little head. 
Um, we're going to start with, um, let me just bring this over here and then I can see this. We're going to start with this little eye and the beak and work on the head and then we're going to come through with the, um, with the, the little breast area. Um, so we're going to start with the dark sepia. So I've got mine nice and sharp here. Um, and dark sepia, polychromos dark sepia, 175. Oops, do it so you can actually see it. Um, really nice colour um, because it's not black, but it's, it's nice and dark and it's quite a neutral colour. So it, it's not going to kind of overtake anything. And you can see here, mine's nice and sharp. Um, obviously, when we're working on pastel matte, you know, we're working on an abrasive paper. It's quite grainy and, you know, it's, you're not going to get lovely clear lines um, in there, unfortunately. So we're going to start on the little eye area here. Um, there is this sort of um, pupil area in the middle and then we've got a little bit of a highlight in there as well. But what we're going to do is we're just going to come around the eye to begin with and just bring that little bit around the eye. It's not so bad actually. Um, being very, very, very careful. So what I don't want you to do is just do a great big strong circle. Um, you want to be just nice and gentle and just gently, gently just kind of waft the dark sepia around the eye area. Now, if you look at your photograph, if you kind of zoom into your photograph, um, the eye, the actual eyeball kind of comes out. So it's not like a, like a true circle around the eye. Um, there's actually sort of like a little bit of an eyeball that comes out there. I don't know whether you can see that. So I'm kind of going to leave that bit there because that's sort of more brownie colored. Um, and we're just going to come around. Just darken that up a little bit more. So put an, another layer in there. I'm using relatively light pressure, um, but enough pressure so that I'm actually getting a, you know, pigment on the surface there. Okay. Um, and then we're going to come in and we're going to just draw this little bit of a, a pupil in the middle. Now, again, this is sort of, um, a, it's, it's almost like an apple with a bite taken out of it, if you like, or a cake with the slice taken out of it because one half of it is the catch light. So we need to be mindful of that, even though it's tiny. So again, we're just going to come around here and we're just going to bring this tiny little pupil area in. We're going to colour it in with the black, but we're not going to bring it all the way round. We're just going to have this sort of um, like a little bit of a slice of cake in there. I mean, it is tiny. Uh, and then I'm going to get my black and we're just going to colour that little bit in. So it's not going to take much. So use very, very tiny, tiny, tiny little pencil strokes, almost like you're just dabbing your pencil onto the surface. And we're just going to fill that little tiny area in there. Like that. So you should have sort of like two half two half circles and one that's sort of been filled in. Next, we're going to um, choose the walnut brown. So the walnut brown, I'm actually going to sharpen this a little bit more, is the 177. And it's a, it's quite a, um, it's kind of bordering on neutral, but it's still quite a warm brown. There's still sort of quite a bit of reddy colours in there. Um, and um, again, this, can you see how that's not quite sharp enough? Let me show it next to the black. Can you see how one of them is sort of like a little bit too blunt? When, and because we're drawing something really small, uh, we want to make sure that we've got the, the, the smallest possible point to be able to work with. Otherwise, it's going to be really like drawing with a poker. So I'm just going to sharpen the, the brown. OK, so that's a little bit better there. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to fill in um, the uh, the irisy bit, I suppose we'd, we'd call it. Again, very, very gentle, little tiny, tiny, tiny pencil strokes because we're, we're talking, you know, a very small area here. Now, when you start to bring this in, you, you might be thinking, well, oh, gosh, it looks very dull. Um, you know, it doesn't really look like uh, the bird's eye on here. And that's because we need to layer into it. We need to bring other colours in there so it actually looks a little bit more realistic. But also don't forget, this is a really small, um, you know, area that we're drawing on. Um, and because we're working with colour pencils, of course, we're going to be layering. Now, if you look at the photograph, you can see that the brown kind of just gently comes 
um, around that edge there. It's almost like it's not straight, but it's um, it doesn't have you can't see the eyelid or anything around it. Now, as soon as we put that um, brown in, the area around the eye starts to disappear. So then we can come back in with the black this time and we can start to just strengthen that up a little bit. So we can add a little bit more pressure um, just around here, just so that we get the shape of the eye coming in around there. Bird eyes are sort of very different to uh, mammal eyes. You know, if you've been used to drawing dogs and, you know, horses and cats and stuff, the bird eyes obviously much, much smaller, um, but the structure is very different as well. Okay, so we've got that in there and I've got a little bit more black on the um, pupil area there. So now what we're going to do is we want to bring a little bit of the uh, light um, around this top bit here. So we've got the catch light, which is great. I haven't actually chosen a white and I don't think we I don't think we necessarily need to. You might have a white in there. Um, any white that you've got, uh, you can you could use. Um, I'm just going to use my um, Pablo white and I'm going to use my warm grey two, which is 271. Now the warm grey two, and excuse me, you know, excuse me if you if you if there might be some of you sitting there going, Bonnie, just draw, please, just crack on and just draw. Um, with my teaching, I like to tell you why I'm doing something and how it can help with your drawings going forwards. I don't just want to say, right, get this pencil, do that, get this pencil, do that. I want to tell you why. Um, the Warm Grey 2 in the Polychromos range is a really, really fantastic pencil, particularly when you're using pastel matte because it kind of blends and smooths the colours. Um, it's very neutral and it's great for eyes to, to kind of bring a little bit of life into them. When we think about eyes, we always think about, oh, you need a catch light, needs to be bright white. Actually, that's not true. You need some of the lovely low lights in there as well, which actually are more grey coloured or can be more grey coloured. Um, so the, the, the warm grey too is a really, really great pencil for that. And I need to sharpen the, I did sharpen all of these before, but they, it needs to be sharper. So I'll just sharpen that. The pencil sharpener I'm using um, is my Swordfish Multipoint, which is an electric sharpener. So it's a very big sharpener. And then I also use a little tiny handheld sharpener for some of my more delicate pencils that, you know, I can't put in the electric one because they'll break. Um, so nice, sharp, warm grey too. And we're just going to come in on the top of the eye here. And we're just going to sweep it around. And then the bottom of the eye here, and again, just sweep it around. You might be thinking, well, you know, I'm just going to put black black blob in. To be honest, if you just want to put a black blob in, you you are so welcome to do that because it will be absolutely fine. <laughs> um, and then I'm just going to bring a little bit of my white, um, and you can use any white that you've got, or if you haven't got a white, doesn't matter. You can just leave it as the paper, and I'm just going to just enhance that little bit of a catch light on the edge there. Um, and then I'm just going to use my black again, just on this bit. And that's that little eye done. Um, so that's that's fab. We don't need to do any more with that. And what we're now going to start looking at is the we're going to sketch out the beak area and then we're going to work on the top of the head. So we're going to start off with the dark sepia again, which is number 175. Um, and we're just going to very gently kind of plot in a little bit more of the beak so that we've got a nice structure in there, but we're not actually going to draw it until we get down there. So the beak area it was kind of drawn in from the line art. Um, we can see that it's got a little bit of a... In fact, what I might do is I might just zoom in on the head, seeing as we're going to be concentrating on the head. Let me just zoom in a little bit. I'll move it. On. I was thinking to, oh, I've got my pencil in my mouth. I was thinking to kind of keep him, um, keep him all in the in the um, in the window at the same time. But uh, actually, it's probably better if we just zoom in a little bit. Don't worry, I'm going to focus him up. That's it. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So um, that's a little bit bigger now, and then we can actually see what we're doing. 
Uh, so I've got a question here from Patricia that says, my pastel mat seems grainy. Yeah, so pastel mat is a, a fantastic surface. It's a it's a unique surface and, and it has quite a lot of um, kind of artisan uh, properties to it in that, that some of the... Uh, uh, some of the production is done by hand, which leads to it having uh, kind of a um, a parameter of quality, shall we say. So you might get pieces that are super smooth. You might get pieces that are a little bit rougher. Um, there are some batches that are literally like pebble dash. Um, and I would urge you, if you get pieces of pastel mat that look like it's, it should be on the side of a wall, um, send it back because that's not what pastel mat is and we know I, I've had conversations with uh, Claire Fontaine and we know that they've had a batch that hasn't been um, that isn't right but on the whole I think at the moment I think we sorted it out pretty much um, and it is a grainy surface even if it feels super smooth it still is quite a grainy surface okay so I've got my dark sepia and what we're going to do is we're just going to come in just on the tip of the beak there and we're just going to gently gently think of your pressure um, if you were uh, drawing on a ripe tomato, so imagine you were drawing on a ripe tomato, you don't want to go through the skin, that's the pressure that you're thinking about doing. You can practice on the back of your hand as well. Uh, so nice and gently, and we're just going to come down and just bring the shape of that little beak in down here. So basically following the, um, the line that I've kind of uh, provided for you. And then we're just going to come up a little bit. We can see there's a little bit of a, a, a V, but very, very, very gently almost like you're sketching. So think of yourself as just sitting and just sketching in a sketchbook. That's the kind of lines we want to be putting in just at the moment. Um, and then we're just gonna come across, you can see here there's sort of like a lighter area. And then we're just gonna come across to sort of like the little, uh, where it kind of joins onto the face there. And then you've got the sort of nostril -y bit in there. Um, and then we've got the, the sort of the beak area there and that comes all the way over to here now just be really careful that you get your beak the right length because it's really really easy to sort of shorten it and 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 kind of maybe stop it here we've got to come right into this little there's like a little um, mark here where it's almost like a little cheek um, and the beak comes right up into there and that's the little line of the whether that's the top part of the beak and that's the bottom part of the beak. And then as we come around here, we can just sort of sweep it in <clears throat> through there. Now, um, doing a line art, I, I created my light, uh, my line art on um, on my iPad using uh, pastel map uh, using uh, Photoshop, um, and. I do that just because it's quicker, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing. You might want to freehand, whatever. However, even if you sort of trace a quick line art, it doesn't mean that all of your work's done for you. You've still got to, you've still, still got to draw it. You've still got to fill it all in. Um, and it's it's really, really key that when you're drawing, you follow your reference photo and not your line art. So we're going to start working on the top of the head now. Now we've got this little uh, bit of a beacon. We're going to start working on the top of the head. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of cold grey too. I'm going to use some uh, bl um, black uh, for this sort of top bit here. And then we're going to move on to using the raw umber and the, uh, yeah, raw umber and the uh, warm grey too. So these are the colours that I'm going to use for the top of the head. Now, if I was drawing this, just sitting here drawing it on my own. I'd maybe pick some other colours to go in there as well, but these ones are going to be fine for what we're doing. So to begin with, I'm going to use my my cold grey two here, which is number um, two three one. Um, and we can see on the top of the head here, it's actually quite cool. There's actually some quite bluey colours in here. Uh, you could use an actual blue if you wanted to. Um, but I'm going to use the, the cooler grey and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to start to to plot in some of the some of the colour so uh, we can see there's a line where the the darker colour then hits the orangey colour and I'm just going to go very very nice and gently gentle pressure it actually comes right up to that little beak this dark area 
and we're just going to go nice and softly. What we don't want is a strong line across the top. We don't want him to look like he's wearing a hat. It wants to be sort of a seamless, um, you know, connection of the different colours. Um, we can't really see the feathers on the top of the head. They're a little bit sort of out of focus. So I'm not going to bring feather direction in. I'm just going to concentrate on sort of filling that area. I might have to go and get, grab my drink in a minute. I've forgotten it. Um, so we just need to concentrate on filling that the little cap on the top of his head there. Trying as well not to create an outline around the head. We don't want to, we don't want to create a line around the head. If we start bringing lines in around animals, it starts to look a little bit um, animated, a little bit cartoon-like, purely because we've got that contrast, um, you know, and we've got sort of like a, a, a strong um, outline around it, and we don't want that uh, when we're drawing realism. So very, very gently coming around here. This line actually sort of um, comes across there, and then it starts to go a little bit browny. You can see there's a uh, a connection where it goes from sort of like quite cool into where the sunshine's obviously hitting it and it goes a little bit warmer. Uh, and then I'm going to bring my black and we're going to bring a little bit of black into here as well. Uh, like I said, you know, if we were sort of drawing this, um, you know, without having picked a load of pencils and everything, you might decide to use some uh, stronger blues and everything in there. But what we're doing here is fine. So again, the black, I'm just going to go nice and gently. My pressure is gentle. I'm still using that sort of sketchy kind of emotion and we're just sort of bringing in that little darker cap on the top there. Uh, it is going to look grainy. You can see mine on the screen is looking grainy. Uh, it doesn't matter. That's what pastel mats kind of all about. We've got the grain there so that we can get the layers in, but there's certainly things that we can do to help with that. You might be working on a hot press or you might be working on drafting film, so you won't have those uh, the same problems as somebody or the same challenges as somebody who is working on pastel mat but you'll have your own challenges um, you know hot press paper you'll need to have very sharp pencils all the way through and you'll also need to ramp up your pressure quite a bit as you bring all of your layers and everything in um, drafting film you have to make sure that your pencil strokes sort of lay down nice and gently next to each other right from the start because the blending is is very very it's very different um, you know, particularly if you're using polychromos and everything like that. Right, okay, so we've got that second layer in there and then I'm going to go back in again with my cold grey too. I'm just going to sharpen it. I've got a bit of a funny end on this. Hang on. There we go. So I'm going to go back in again and this is all part of the layering. Um, we we layer on pastel mat, we layer light over dark. So we start with light, we then go dark, we then go light again. And we're starting to get a little bit more of this bluey kind of color in. And you can see straight away that it just blends and smooths the, the darker color, the black, really, really nicely. This is one of the um, brilliant and I think um, very much needed techniques when you're using pastel mat. I think when people start using pastel mat and they've come from like a hot press paper or something like that. They don't always recognize that you need to do this and then it leads to frustration and then, you know, pastel mat's horrible and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but every, every different surface needs a slight tweak in techniques. And it's quite good actually to kind of work on different surfaces so that you can get all of those different te techniques under your belt, you know, so and in there. This is where you could get a, like a, a, a brightish blue. You could bring a brightish blue in here if you had something like, um, what have I got here? Maybe like, um, I've got a cobalt blue here. You could bring a little bit of cobalt blue into here. Um, you know, if you've got something sort of brightish around, you could bring a little bit of blue in. Um, if you haven't got blue, it doesn't matter. Um, and that way you're just gonna bring some sort of a little bit of that coolness in there. And then you can bring the black in again just to get that nice uh, little bit more darkness in there and you can see my pencil strokes are very small um, I'm being really careful about where I'm laying my pencil and I'm also being very careful about the pressure that I'm using so I'm using just enough pressure to be able to give me um, a, a relatively dark black um, but not too much pressure that uh, you know it's sort of I don't know, 
it's making my wrist hurt. We, we never want to have uh, anything that we're doing creative wise that's going to make us hurt. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I don't do an awful lot of stuff on hot press paper is because you do need to have a lot more um, uh, pressure when you're using hot press paper. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not uh, I'm not overly keen on using it because then I have to go for physio. <laughs> so anyway, so we've got this little black uh, uh, cap going on in here, which is looking quite nice, looking quite sort of soft. Um, OK, so what's a great sharpener? So there are a lot of sharpeners around. You can get the little tiny ones like this, little handheld ones. Um, this is a um, a cum K U, is it K U double N K U M magnesium pencil sharpener. So it's just I think it's about two pounds from Amazon. A really really great little sharpener. It's got the two holes in it, um, but um, I only use the small hole. You can see there. I only use the small one and I tend to use that for my Derwent drawings and any light fast pencils that, that just break at the, you know, as soon as you pick them up. Um, and then I have my Swordfish Multipoint, which is a big electric one, which I absolutely love. Then you can have crank sharpeners, sort of hand crank ones. Um, I like, I tend to like the Swordfish ones. I've always had Swordfish ones, but Derwent do some good ones. Um, you know, so I think it's um, very much personal choice, but when I first started drawing, I have to say, um, I did a, I did a workshop with Anne Kohlberg in 2017. She came, this is the cold grey again. She came to do a workshop in the UK and, um, and, and it was for the UK CPS and I, I managed to get a place, which was amazing. And she had this electric pencil sharp and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, you know, why would you need an electric pencil sharpener? And um, and actually, then I got an electric pencil sharpener, and my life changed. My <laughs> life changed completely. They're the most amazing things. They're 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 incredible. Um, so yeah, it's very personal. But I like the swordfish ones. And then Vicky's also said, does blending differ in using hot press paper? So yeah, um, yes. So pastel mat with it being an an abrasive surface, and we're using these hard dry pencils it actually moves around quite easily in those initial layers with your hot press paper that's what I was talking about using a little bit heavier pressure to be able to kind of um blend everything in but actually they it does blend quite nicely um you know your pencils will still move around quite a bit right so we're going to move on to using the raw umber which is 180 oops can you see that um, and I'm going to bring a little bit of the, that walnut brown in here as well. We're going to be really gentle with this because um, I don't want it to... Let me just shimmy that over there a little bit and then we're not... That's it. Um, I, we, we, we just need to keep this sort of brown on top of the head here, just really nice and gentle. And if you look at your photograph, you can see we've got sort of like quite a, a, a warmish brown here and then it moves to being a little bit yellowish here. Um, now the raw umber is a really nice colour, but it has got quite a bit of yellow in it. Um, so that's why I just want to sort of um, balance it out a little bit with the walnut brown in there as well. So I'm going to start off with the raw umber and just go very, very, very gently. Again, you can see my hand sort of slightly further back um, so that I don't, I can't exert too much pressure on here. Uh, this is where actually it's a little bit more favourable to have a blunter pencil on pastel mat rather than a sharper one, uh, because actually I want the softness to come through. Can you also see where this brown is, where it then kind of comes onto the edge of the paper? It sort of lightens, it sort of fades off onto the edge of the paper. We want to capture that. That's a, re that's a really, really nice thing to capture. Uh, you know, rather than having sort of like a strong colour all the way to the edge. Like I was saying before, we don't want any lines or anything. And actually to have it just softly, just gliding off the surface is really, really nice. Um, we might tickle this up a little bit and bring a little bit more of that dark onto the top here. Or just use a bit of the kneadable eraser and just get rid of a little bit of that dark. But I won't know that until I've got a little bit more of this um, brown in. My eraser that I use, my kneadable eraser... Um, is very much a tool that I use, not really for um, correcting mistakes as such. It's more for uh, sort of helping me build my layers, helping me bring a little bit of 
um, highlights, all of that kind of stuff in. Um, so if I make a mistake on pastel mat, I just layer over the top of it and I incorporate it into what I'm doing. So I've found that I'll very, very rarely get a rubber and rub stuff out. Um, I tend to just build it into what I'm doing which is, I found is quite a nice way of drawing. Um, it means that there's sort of a little bit less stress. Um, you know, if I know that I can just layer into it, then it, it, you know, I don't have to worry if something's gone a bit wrong. Um, now we've got to just watch around here because we've got this little bit of orange coming up above the eye area here. So just going to put a little bit more down there. And then we sort of just very, very, very gently, just going to come around so I'm using very gentle pressure here just to get that sort of more lighter beigey colour coming through. Um, and again, we can use uh, the kneadable eraser in there a little bit as well, just to sort of help bring a little bit more light in there. You can also see how the grain works on the pastel mat. Um, it's a little bit more grainy up here, but it's become a little bit smoother here. And I think that's also to do with me just lightening my pressure a little bit. Just nice and gently. And then we start to come down here and it starts to get a little bit greyer. So the other amazing or fascinating, not amazing, but fascinating thing about colour pencils is um, that you go through these stages of your um, of your work looking really, really quite awful. Um, <laughs> and you'll find that, you know, colour pencil artists who have just stuck with it have a... Um, an awful lot of patience and kind of when they're drawing don't don't tend to get too frustrated because they know this this is part of the the um the process um okay so my kneadable eraser this is it here this disgusting yucky yucky thing here a uh, faber castell one and i tend to use the whole thing and all i'm going to do is i'm just going to sort of dab the edges here just to sort of soften it a little bit take away a little bit of the uh the line that's coming around there and then I'm just going to nudge into that little bit of the, the, the dark that I put in there as well, just so I've got this nice connection between the dark bit and the light bit, because it, it is light rather than uh, colour. So it's the lighting that's causing the, the dark area. And I'm just going to dab that in. And that's just going to give me a little bit of structure. It's going to bring a little bit of highlight in there. Not, not a huge amount. It's not like you can, you know, it doesn't make a, have a massive, massive difference. But it just gives me enough to be able to go, all oh, right, I need to just, you know, work on that bit, work on that bit. Um, oh, he has a, so somebody has a groove in, I'm guessing it's in the pastel mat. If you've got like a, a dent in your pastel mat, it's a very common thing. The best thing to do is try to ignore it. Usually what happens when you get a dent in your pastel mat, um, it, it's usually in a place where you really, really don't want it, like across an eye or something like that. The best thing to do is ignore it, build your layers up around it, um, try not to put sharp pencils in it to cover it up or anything like that. Just work as if, you, as if it wasn't there. And eventually by the time you get all of your layers in, it should start to disappear. Um, I know every single piece where I've had something with a, a bit of a line in it or a scratch in it, I've managed to get, I've managed to get through it. Um, you know, so yeah, it's just a question of just, you know, holding your nerve and keeping going. Right, so I'm going to use my warm grey two, 271, and I'm just going to come in over the top of the, um, the brown that I put in. And again, we're going to have that very similar effect um, of it just smoothing and blending a little bit. And again, I'm just going to come and connect the two areas, the two bits of lighting. So I'm just going to come in through here. I can use little round pencil strokes. Um, I can use sort of almost tufty pencil strokes so I can go as if I'm trying to draw little tufts of hair. You can see, I don't know if you can see them, but I've got like a funny little bit of um, texture in the pastel mat there, which again, I'm just going to try and ignore because once I get a few more layers in there, it should be fine. I'm just going to do like a little bit of fuzziness on the top of the head area. And we're just going to come uh, down and around. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get onto, I want to get the top of the head here done and then try and get onto that, um, this little um, red uh, breast area here because that's 
that's going to be really, really nice and fun to draw. You know, those bright colours are always lovely to draw. And we're going to be mixing oranges and reds and, um, yeah, oranges and reds in there just to get that nice sort of colour. OK, so I'm just going to come down the side of the neck area there. Nice and gently. You can see I'm just going backwards and forwards. We don't need to bring feather details and all of that kind of stuff in. What we want to be doing is we want to be getting that that feeling of the little um, of the little cap in there. Uh, and then again, I'm just going to come in with my kneadable eraser. Um, and then I want to use my walnut brown, which is the um, the 177. And I'm going to bring a little bit of that through into that blacky area in here. Through there and we can start to actually bring a little bit of structure into here as well. So that it, you know, it looks like it's not just one flat colour. And this is where we can start to bring a tiny little bit of detail in with that walnut brown, which is going to just give us those little shadowy areas. And again, I'm just sort of dotting my pencil onto the surface because it's quite a small area. Um, you know, it's not like we, I mean, this is sort of like tiny, tiny area that we're doing here. So I'm just dotting that colour in there and you can start to see how it's starting to take shape. It's starting to actually look like uh, almost like a 3D object. So just dotting the uh, the brown in a little bit over the top so that we're starting to get a bit of structure in there. So we start to bring details in uh, regardless really of the surface that you're working on. Once you've sort of got your, uh, your values, um, colour, all of that kind of stuff down on the surface. Um, it works particularly well with pastel matte because, um, you know, pastel matte, uh, has this sort of abrasive surface that takes quite a lot of layers. So by adding these lovely base layers in first, you get to be able to create the details on the top really easily. So just going to bring that in there a little bit. And then I can just bring my, wall, uh, my warm grey too again in over the top. Just very gently. glazing over the top. When we talk about glazing, it's just a very light, um, the lightest sort of pressure that you can muster over the top of your layers. So you don't lose texture and you don't really put a colour in, um, but it just gives a little bit of something in there. Okay, good. And then I'm just going to use a tiny weeny little bit of black uh, just in here again, just to create A little bit of um, a little bit more structure in there, and now what we can do is we can start to come down and we can start to draw the beak area in um, and bring a little bit of this oranginess in here as well. So um, let's get the orangey bit around the eye, and the colours we're going to be using there. Again, I've kept it quite sort of simple. Um, I just get these colours out, and then we can have a look at what we're doing. So these are the, um, the five colours that I've got for doing the, uh, the breast area. We've got cadmium orange, which is a very bright, that's what you kind of class as your, you know, your orangey orangey, cadmium orange. Um, I've got terracotta, which is more of a sort of a, a darker orange. Um, I've got, we then go, I've got a yellow um, and we've got the light yellow ochre. And then we go into the reds. So the reds, I've got India red, one of my favourite reds. This is an, an amazing, amazing colour. And then I've got Caput Mortem Violet, which is that sort of darker, darker red that has got the, the sort of the purpley tones to it. And we're going to start off with the uh, Cadmium Orange, which is 111. So it's a very, it's a very bright orange, very vibrant orange. I'm not actually going to sharpen mine more than that. 
Um, and we're just going to start on the edge here. And you can see, again, when you look at the picture, you can see the lighting. So we're very bright and vibrant over here, very bright down here. And then the rest of it is actually quite dull. Um, alternative colours don't have walnut brown, just anything that's sort of brownie coloured. Um, anything that's like a dark brown will do, be fine. Okay, so I'm going to take my cadmium orange and we're going to put it in and it's going to look very bright to begin with because we need to dull it down in this shadowy area. And this comes right across over the top of that little beak there. Now, the other thing about using these sort of more uh, vibrant, bright colours is that quite a lot of them have got a slightly softer pigment, even though we're still working in the polychromos range. Um, the different pigments have a different feel. So the cadmium orange has actually got sort of like a, a little bit more of um, a, a creamy feel to it when you actually put it down on the surface. I'm just going to use my dark sepia just here a little bit just to get uh, the edge of this little beacon. Um, yeah, so, you know, quite a lot of the colours can feel a little bit gritty and grainy and then you get others that feel really, really quite creamy. Um, the reds tend to be like that and some of the oranges as well. OK, so we're just going to take a little bit of that up. Got to be careful when we're using the orange along with the black because the black has got blues in it and we've obviously got those uh, cold greys in there as well. And of course, anything that's yellow based, which is the orange and anything that's blue based, um, when you mix them, you're going to get green. Um, you know, that's just basic colour theory that we learn at school. Um, and it's really, really important to bring that into your coloured pencil work. You might be a real, um, you might be somebody who loves looking at all of the, 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 the data and the figures and all of the sort of the, you know, um, getting really, really technical about stuff. Um, and you can get really technical about colour theory. I, I just like to keep everything really, really simple. So, you know, I talk about uh, colour theory in very simple terms with everything that I do, just because I don't think we need to complicate. We don't need to complicate anything, really. Um, I'm going to leave a little bit of this out because I'm going to bring some of that yellow in. Um, I'm just going to come around the eye area here. You can see... Um, where we need to start bringing all sorts of different little colory bits in here just to sort of get the idea of the structure of the face and how all of these little colours work. So I'm going to move now. Um, we could have used a brighter yellow, but I've chosen the light yellow ochre. And I'm just going to bring a little bit of this light yellow ochre in just around the eye area here. It's probably not really bright enough, but I... It's, it'll be fine. This is why I um, I don't really like choosing colours before I draw something because it you know I like to sort of choose them as we're as we're working. So I'm just going to leave a little bit of the paper showing around the outside of that little bit of the eye there for the white. Might bring a little bit of white in there as well. I think if you've got some pencils, you tend to have black and white, so it would be relatively safe bringing a little bit of that in. Um, and then I'm just going to bring a little bit of the yellow into here as well, and then we're going to start to darken it up. So when we're talking about, or when we're thinking about shadows on something that's orange, uh, we have to look at the colour wheel. Or, I mean, I, I'll look at the colour wheel. Um, and we have to look at what um, is a complementary colour because complementary colours are going to give a really fantastic shadow, usually. Um, and when we look at orange, the, um, the complementary colour of orange is actually blue. Um, but we know that if we put blue into the orange, then we are going to get sort of like a, a, a greeny colour. So then we start to go around the other way and we start to look at split complementaries and triadic colours. And, um, and there's two ways you can go. So you can kind of go, you've got your complementary and then you can go this way or you can go this way. One way you go actually go into the greens, the other way you go into your purples. Um, and that's why I would use something that's got purpley 
uh, tones in the colour as a shadow for orange, uh, just because we're not going to get that that sort of greeny colour coming through. Sometimes you want a greeny colour and that's fine. Um, but in this case, I want sort of like the, the those more purpley tones. And when we first start drawing, I know I did this, I'd be looking at a shadow and I'd be like, well, I'll put, just put black in there or I'll just put grey in there. And you tend to get very flat colours and they tend to go quite muddy as well. So using uh, the colour wheel and starting to understand a little bit more about colour theory is really, really important. So we're going to we're going to use the Caput Morton Violet, which is the number 263. And we're actually going to start to bring in a little bit of the shadows into here. Um, funnily enough, the bit over here is a little bit greeny, but um, I'm just going to use my Caput Morton Violet very, very, very gently. And we're just going to start to bring some of the little shadowy areas in over the top of the cadmium orange. And this is where this is this is what's just so beautiful about colored pencils is just that that you're mixing the colors on the paper, you're mixing them on the surface. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just fantastic to see things come to life. It really, really is. Um, so I'm just using very, very gentle, gentle, gentle um, pencil strokes here just to kind of get those little shadowy areas in. Let's bring it up here. Now, the other thing that might be a little bit of a challenge, if you've done your line art, and you've maybe used a little bit of heavy pressure when you did your line art, you might find that wherever your line is, you've got a little bit of an indent in there as well. And it's quite difficult to, um, to sort of move it, uh, you know, to get rid of it. Um, and again, it's, it's just really important not to panic. And it's just a case of just keeping on going, just gentle layers, gentle layers. Um, and it will eventually sort of sort itself out. Um, but it can be a little bit frustrating. I don't like to use indenting techniques on pastel mat at all. Um, I, I just find that if you indent the surface, it can sort of disturb the, um, the surface around that indent and it can make it a little bit more challenging to sort of work with. So you can see here, I'm just coming down and it's really, it's starting to take shape now. We're starting to get something that looks structured. It looks really quite nice. Um, and again, it's still quite grainy, but actually I don't mind it being grainy. Uh, I, I will always try and use the, 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 the tooth of the surface that I'm working on to my advantage. So if, if I need something to be a little bit textured, then I'll use the tooth to, to help me. So we're just going to come around here. Just going to bring a little bit more of that Caput Morton Violet in there. And then I just want to just bring a... Um, I'll probably come in with a little bit more of the orange in here just as a light over dark just to sort of help smooth it a little bit um, because the dark on the the dark pencils on the white pastel mat do go very very grainy again we can use the um the warm gray too um we could use that to help sort of smooth it out but i think what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to use the um cadmium orange again over the top I'm going to use that as my light colour, light over dark. Very gently. Again, I'm not using strong, strong pressure here at all. I've got some little light um, areas in there that um, it's, a, it's just a little bit too small to sort of keep all of those in, but I don't think it really matters. And hopefully you can see that the um, cadmium orange over the top of the cap. Uh, Caput Morton Violet is just, it makes it a little bit paler, but it um, it smooths and blends, which is really nice. And you should be able to do all of this with uh, whatever other surfaces you're using as well. If you're using drafting film, you'll find, um, it, you'll find it an awful lot easier because, um, of course, you're not contending with any tooth. When I say easier, you'll find other things are a little bit, you know, you might find a challenge, but... Uh, on the whole, just laying the colour down, it will be um, it will be easier. So I'm quite liking this. Uh, I want to bring a little bit of my uh, terracotta in, which is one eight one eight six. So this is a little bit stronger colour. If you look at the cadmium orange and the terracotta next to each other, you can see that the terracotta is much stronger. There's a little bit more red in there as well. 
Um, and I'm just going to bring a little bit of that kind of through into the eye here. Not into the eye, but around the eye. You can see that there's actually, there should be a lot more yellowiness around there. And, I, and if you have something like a, a dark cadmium yellow, that would be a really nice colour to bring in there. Um, I'll just show you what it looks like. There we go. So that's the dark cadmium yellow, which is 108. So you could use some of that and that would work really, really nicely in this area here. Um, if you haven't got it, don't worry. But, um, you know, if you wanted to put a little bit of yellow in there, that's going to work really, really nicely as well as a nice yellow. OK, so coming back in again with the terracotta, um, I'm just going to bring a little bit more into here. And then down underneath the little eye here. So really nice and gently. And he's got he's actually got this little sort of white area around the eye, but it's so small you can't really see it. in there which is quite nice and then I'm going to use my um, Caput Morton Violet again and just bring a little bit of that around so we've got some again some structure around the eye area there take a little bit of that into there as well And with them being sort of quite small, you know, um, and, and the, you know, eventually we're going to be doing, we're going to have the whole, the, the, the bird as a whole, basically. You know, don't feel that you've got to really um, capture every single tiny detail in the face. It's, it's, not, it's not necessary. And actually, it can be, it can draw away from uh, the whole piece if you've got tons and tons and tons of details in there. So I'm just going to come back into here, darken this up come back over onto here and just darken some of those little areas in there as well and then I just want to darken in here and I might bring a little bit of the um, dark sepia uh, just on this area here just to darken it uh, how do I take pastel matte down it curls up yeah so pastel matte um, has this uh, funny funny thing <laughs> where it where it curls up which can be really annoying um and it's and it's normal it's very very normal um it's just due to the moisture content between the backing and the actual surface uh, i use i use magnets on mine i just i have a glass drawing board and i use a magnet in front and a magnet behind and i just sort of pop the magnets on the corners um and it works beautifully so that's all i do um okay so dark sepia again and I just want to, again, just uh, just come in here where we've got this very dark, shadowy bit just above the um, just above the beak and just get that nice and dark. Again, using nice, gentle pressure. You don't want to be using really strong pressure. Um, and then I'm just going to use a little bit more over here as well. I think once we get the beak in, uh, we should be able to see that quite nicely. And then I've got my little tiny cotton bud here. This one has got a sharp end. Um, I've got two sorts of cotton buds. I've got ones, these ones aren't, these ones aren't actually that great. I got them off Amazon and I think they're not great. These are too fluffy, these ones. And as soon as I start to kind of put it on the pastel mat, they start to fluff up. Um, so actually for a piece like this, these little tiny ones with these little pointy ends are, are really, really good. So I'm just going to come in and I'm just going to sort of just gently blend a little bit in there. Now, if you're using drafting film, this isn't going to work. Um, you know, it's very much about how you're layering your pencil. And if you're using, if you're using hot press, it might work. Um, just very not all over but just in just in areas just to give it a little bit of um just around there as well through there 
in there, which is fine. Okay. And then I'm just going to use that dark sepia again in here just to uh, darken up that bit there on the top. And then we're going to start working on that little beak area. I think he's looking quite cute, actually. Um, okay, so um, I want to just bring this little bit of the side of his face in on the other side of the beak. So we're kind of looking up. So we've got the underside of the beak rather than the whole of the beak. Um, and I'm going to use a little bit of terracotta first. Um, just in this sort of little triangle area here. Um, it's very much sort of the side of his head. So I'm going to use the terracotta first just to give me a base of orange. Then I'm going to use some Caput Morton Violet. Um, in here. Very gently again, so really, really, really gentle. And just, just really dotting the pencil rather than anything. And then I'm going to use a little bit of dark sepia on the top. Again, very tiny, tiny, tiny pencil strokes. So I've got my uh, pointed, um, uh, little pointed cotton buds. I've just got them from Amazon. I think they're for like jewellery making or something like that. Um, I just got them from Amazon. They came in a bag like this. They just came in bags like this. Oh, you can't see that. It's just a plastic bag. So they don't come in a box or anything like that. And they're, they're not super soft, but for little tiny intricate areas, it's quite good actually. Um, right, okay, so the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring a little bit of a stronger line just where the beak um, sort of meets the, the little bit of the side of his head there. And then we're going to start working on the actual little beak area. So we're going to use your um, warm grey 4, which is 273. And what we're going to do is we're going to start to kind of uh, create the structure of the beak. And there is some sort of browny, yellowy bits in there as well. If you look at the beak, you can see some sort of yellowy areas coming down here. You're also going to get a little bit of the orange from the, the actual bird's feathers reflected in here too. So it's quite nice to bring a little bit of that orangey colour in there. It, it makes it seem a little bit more realistic if you've got that little bit of a, a reflection in there. Um, so warm grey four. And what I want to be quite careful about is actually that we do capture these highlights. Uh, light and dark is really, really important when you're creating realism. And, um, you know, if you sort of leave important lighting areas out, it can it can affect things quite strongly. So we need to be quite careful when we're coming down the, the, the broad side of the bottom of the beak here that we do create these little highlights. So we're going to go nice and gently. I, I do completely get it's a tiny area. Um, so we're just going to go nice and gently, really, really sharp, sharp pencil. And we're just going to go nice and slowly. Um, this isn't dark enough, but we're just sort of um, creating the, the structure first and then we can go a little bit darker. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a straightish line. And then and I'm going to go tiny weeny little round pencil strokes. Kind of all the way down until we've hit that little V. And then I'm going to look, kind of lift my pressure even more. So I'm, I'm going even lighter down here. because I don't want a lot of grey in there because it is a little bit more, more browny. And then on the top of the beak here. I'm just going to go very, very, very gently in again with the warm grey four. It's a, it's a tiny area. OK, that's not so bad, is it? OK, so we can come in with the dark sepia now, which is the uh, the one seven five. Um, and I'm just going to uh, create a little bit more depth in that little um, nostril area there. So 
I've got a really great question here um, that Vicky sent me, uh, which is how do you know what colour to use first? Is it experience? And it definitely is experience. And it's also, so the experience comes from obviously using colour, from getting used to colour, from understanding your colours. Um, it also comes, I think, from being quite brave with your colours and not allowing yourself to become reliant on um, things like apps and all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, there are some apps out there and they can be helpful. I've just taken that little nostril a little bit too far. They can be helpful in sort of finding colours, but what they do is they pick a pixel. Um, so they'll they'll pick a pixel in your on your photograph and they'll tell you what colour it is and they'll even tell you what colours to layer. Um, I mean, the technology is amazing, but it doesn't do anything for your um, for your learning. And actually, there are some pretty simple ish ways of learning how to use color. Um, one of the easiest ways is just to look at your color on the screen and find a pencil color that's similar to it and go with that. My first color pencil drawings. I was like, what colour is that? What colour, What pencil colour is it? I'll just go with that. And then as you become a little bit more um, confident as you're, as you're doing your drawings, um, you start to go, oh, I wonder if I use this here or I wonder if I use that there. You then kind of come uh, become a member of groups and you get to hear other people's experiences. You ask questions, you get a critique. Um, you know, if you can, if you can put, I remember the first critique I had was from, um, Lisa Clough, you know, Lacry Fine Art. And she, she used to do some, um, critiques on YouTube and I'm, I was really lucky to get a piece in and she was very, very, um, she was really nice about this piece. It was a, it was a cockapoo I did. Um, and there were lots of like curly shapes and everything. And she was like, oh, actually, if you used some purple, some violety colors in with that sort of yellowy, creamy color you've got in there, it's going to give you really great shadows. That was a massive light bulb moment for me. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, instead of using gray in my shadows, I, I can start to use all of these other colors, experimented with that, pushed it, looked at other colors that I could use. And that's how I progressed my work. So you know, a lot of it is picking stuff up from other artists and then going away and playing with it and, and you know, deciding how you can how you can fit that in with what you're doing. Um, and I think it's really, really important to experiment with your pencils and not be scared. Another really nice uh, way of sort of di sort of discerning colour um, is just picking to begin with three colours. So say you're drawing a brown dog. Um, pick your lightest colour that you can see, the darkest colour you can see, and, and a mid colour. And just pick those three colours and use those three colours. I'm just going to use my warm grey too here just to sort of smooth this little bit out here. Um, and you can use those three colours. Then when you get a little bit more proficient in sort of like, um, you know, bringing those three colours together, you can then go, right, I've got my three colours now. I'm going to bring some complementary colours in for those three colours that I've chosen. So you might have six colours that you're going to work with. And by that point, you're starting to get really sort of quite experimental and quite confident with your colours. And you start to kind of reach for the colours that have worked with you in the past. And that's how I that's how I learned my colours. Um, you know, I drew on a very regular basis. Well, every single day I drew um, and um yeah, and I experimented and I played around with colour and I was like, what does this do? What does that do? And that is that is the best way, I think, to learn colour. Um, OK, so I'm just going to come down into this little bit. I'm just going to increase the size of that just a touch. And then I'm going to come into the beak area and darken this up. So we've got the little end, end bit on the beak. And then it's much darker under here. Can you see also there's like a little bit of a, a lighter line um, that's kind of coming between the dark area and the actual beak. There's a little bit of a, a, a paler uh, highlighted bit at the back there. Okay, so I'm just going to come through into here. Nice and gently. 
again, I'm going to bring a little bit of orange in there as well when we've finished. I've got that nice sort of dark um, shadowy bit under there. I've got that little nosy bit there. And then I'm just going to bring my dark sepia again in here. Just for that little um, beak line there. And then I'm going to bring my, I think, my warm grey two in. Um, so warm grey two, the, uh, the 271. And I'm just going to bring some of that warm grey two into the top here, over the top of that warm grey four. So it just sort of smooths it out a little bit. And I'm just going to bring a little bit of that in there. So we don't have to go crazy, crazy with the details. We just need it to look like a beak. And actually, you know, less is more in a lot of these cases. Um, we just need to have the structure and everything in there. And then just going to come in with the warm grey two in over here. And you can see how it's just blending that out really quite nicely. Okay. And then I'm just going to use my that little bit of white in here. And in there, and I think that's probably around about it for that little bit because it is so small. Um, hang on, let's just... Okay. So I don't think we need to make to do much more with that. The, the problem when you've got something quite little, um, the the, um, the the risk is that you start to faff around with it, and 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 actually it would have been absolutely fine as it was, and then you start to faff about with it, and then you're like, oh, I wish I'd left it as it was. So we'll we'll stop. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll stop faffing. Uh, right, okay, so now what we can do is we can come down and we can start to bring a little bit of, um, of orange down into here. I'm just going to reduce the size of this just a little bit so we get more on the screen. Okay, and I might just move him up a tad. Right, so let's bring a little bit more of the orange um, into here. So. I'm going to start with the, I'm actually going to start with the cadmium orange again. It's very, very bright. Down this side here, we can see that it is, it goes a lot duller because it is, we've got that gorgeous shadow coming straight across here. Um, and then we've got this sort of lighter bit around here as well. So I'm going to come in with the um, cadmium orange very, very, very gently. I'm not looking to draw feathers at the moment. There are feathers on the robin that we can we can put lots of details in. These feathers here aren't the ones. We, what we want to portray is fluffy. We want fluffiness in here. Um, and that is what's going to kind of give us the, the quality of the, of the feathers. So just really, really nice, gentle. You can see how my, um, my pencil's kind of going backwards and forwards, a little bit round and round. I'm not drawing feathers, I'm just drawing fluff. Okay, so just coming through here. I've got the naughty dogs, I can hear the naughty dogs wanting to come in. <laughs> I can hear, Vinny's just rushed down the stairs, let himself into the living room. Um, I think he's been on my bed. <laughs> so naughty. Poor boy, I left him in the garden. I put him in the garden because he wanted to go in the garden and then I forgot all about him. I think he was out there for about 20 minutes. And it was only when he started woofing that I realised he was out there. Um, okay, so again, we, we can sort of see the direction of the feathers and it's a little bit like fur that we can kind of take our pencil in the direction. But hopefully you can see that um, there's the grain is showing through. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and hopefully you can see and hear that it's not bothering me. I'm not worried about it because I know, I know this surface. I know that I can get lots and lots of lovely layers on it, um, you know, and, and we can make a really lovely, rich, deep, uh, you know, picture. Plus I can get the softness that I want as well. Um, you know, the quality of what we're drawing is really important and it's really not about all of the details. Um, 
but it's it's funny if you were on my um live stream last week you will have heard me talking about the process that we all every single one of us when we start drawing realistically we all go through this same process and it's um I, I don't know why I didn't pick up on it before, but I've been teaching now since 2019. And um, it's really, really clear now to me that every single person who is drawing in a realistic style with colour pencils goes through exactly the same process. Um, I went through it. All of my students go through it. Um, and it's incredibly interesting. And um, we all go through it at different uh, sort of... Um, speeds some people are super speedy some people take more time you know it's very dependent on personality and everything and basically what happens is when you first start drawing um so i'm talking like this because we're just kind of going backwards and forwards with the orange so there's nothing really interesting happening but basically when we first sort of pick up a pencil and we're like oh we're, i'm going to start drawing a realistic subject what happens is uh, you know, we start we start to draw and, and then we, we very quickly realise that, you know, we can't just put one layer down. We have to put a few layers down to get the richness. We then notice that or, or we think, well, if I'm going to draw realistically, I need to um, I need to draw all, all of the details. All of the details need to be in there. So then we draw all of the details because we know that a, a realistic drawing has loads of details. Then we get to the point where we're like, well, hang on a second, I'm drawing all of the details, but I'm not entirely certain that um, my drawing's looking as realistic as I, I, I need it to look. Um, and then the realisation comes that we need to start bringing values in. We need to, you know, darks and lights are really, really important. So then we start to incorporate darks and lights into our work. Um, and then we have like a big um, light bulb moment where we realise that the darks and lights are really important, but actually... The details aren't important at all. <laughs> Even though we're drawing realistically, we don't need details. <laughs> and the details start to become different things. The details start to become little tiny nuances and subtle changes in the darks and the lights. Um, and then once you kind of get your head around that, um, the world's your oyster. Because that then you're kind of at a level where you, you could pretty much draw anything um, and it looked really, really realistic because you've then got all of the tools and we all have to go through that process to kind of come out at the other end. It's so interesting. Um, right, so instead of me coming all the way down here, in fact, I might come all the way down there. Let me just lift him up a little bit more so I'm not coming off the, there we go. So let's go down to here. So that cadmium orange again down here. And hopefully you can see on your photograph that you've got that the, um, the orange really does dull when it comes down here because it's sitting in that shadow. Um, and we need it to be different. We need it to be duller. We need it to be darker uh, so that it's, you know, it kind of fits with what it is that we're drawing. And hopefully you can also see that I'm kind of just putting, oh well, I'm guessing I'm putting probably about two or three layers in at once because I'm going over and over with my pencil and I'm quite sketchy. So my initial pencil marks are quite sketchy. I like to teach in this way. I like to share um, that actually being a little bit looser in those early stages, it creates a really lovely feeling of movement in your animals. It really, really does. Right, so the next color I'm gonna bring in is actually the, um, the light yellow ochre. Um, and we're gonna stick with the, the, the shadowy area down here. So light yellow ochre, it's number 183. It's a really useful colour as this. Um, we're going to start up at the top here and we're just going to bring it in over the top of that cadmium yellow. Might not have a massive difference, uh, a massive, um, might not make a massive change, but uh, it, we're going to give it that kind of a dull feeling. Uh, you know, we've got the orange down there, which has got the, the sort of the bright element to it. Now we're going to give it a little bit of a dull feeling. Um, so just bringing that in over the top and it and it makes it look a little bit sort of mustardy. Again, we're just going round and round. Very gentle pressure. Think about drawing on a ripe tomato. You know, you don't want to be squ squirting it everywhere. So, you know, just be really nice and gentle. The other thing about going nice and gently um, in your initial layers is if you do need to lift it off, if you do need to take pigment off, 
it is way easier to take pigment off that's been put on lightly <laughs> than it is if you've been going hell for leather. Um, and it also uh, enables you to put more layers and all of that kind of stuff in as well. So, um, you know, the other thing as well is with pastel matte particularly, if you go in too heavy at the beginning, um, what can happen is it can actually show the grain up a little bit too much as well. So it's more that's more of a psychological thing than than anything else. So just nice and gently, we're just going to come down all the way down here. So, you know, we're not going to finish this tonight. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to apologize about that. <laughs> um, I'm always apologizing about stuff um, because what I want to do is I want to give people a really, really great experience with the drawing rather than, you know, I do do like I do do speed draws and I like the speed draws because that stops people from. Well, it, well, I'm saying it stops people from worrying. It can stop people from worrying or it can make people worry enormously. <laughs> it, can, it can really bring on the stress levels. Um, so just sort of, you know, just going nice and nice and gently. And some of you might be thinking that I'm drawing really speedily at the minute. I think it's just because I kind of go backwards and forwards with my pencil. Um, but I want to give you a, a really great experience so that you can you can then, you know, start to uh, to work on your own pieces you can start to really build your techniques and everything like that and um, you know uh, take on all of this knowledge and do something with it which I think is really really important ultimately that's what you know we, that's what I want to be doing is teaching people to or giving people all of the information they need so that they can then just go and do their own stuff um, you know which is um, that's what we all want to do isn't it okay Right. OK, so we've got that little bit of uh, that um, light yellow ochre in there. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to come in with the terracotta and we're just going to build a little bit up into here. So this is still looking rough and ready. We're going to address that um, in a second, but I'm just going to bring the terracotta in and uh, I'm going to start up on a little bit of the beak there. So we've still got nice sharp pencils and I also want you to kind of have a look at the pencils. So I've sharpened mine once. I know we haven't done a huge amount, um, but there is a, a lot of um, um, a lot of myths, I think, that that are spread about pastel matte. And one of them is it eats your pencils. Um, and I get really frustrated <laughs> when I say, "Ah, oh, pastel matte eats your pencils." Pastel matte doesn't eat your pencils at all sharpening your pencils eats your pencils and you can see here that with really nice light pressure even though I'm using pastel matte and it's not the smoothest of pieces I'm not you know I've only sharpened this one once it's certainly not eaten it yet I know I haven't used it a huge amount but it's how you use your pencils and what you do with your pencils that kind of um, you know that's you know and sharpening your pencils definitely is what eats your pencils um and if you're used to using a hot press paper you're used to then using a very sharp pencil the majority of the time um so you might be kind of going you know every time you do a few strokes you're back in with your pencil sharpener then you're back on the pastel mat yeah that is really going to eat your pencils but you don't need to have super sharp pencil all of the time for pastel mat um you know with hot press I do think it's easier to have really super sharp pencils um and actually I find I use more of my pencils if I'm using hot press than I do with pastel matte so um you know just nice light pressure uh and um you know these sort of techniques that I'm showing you here and you'll be you'll be well on your way to using um pastel matte um what color am I using so it was yellow ochre and then I'm now using terracotta and I'm just kind of following the uh, the flow of the feathers, but I'm certainly not drawing all of the little um, feathery details or anything like that, um, which I, I quite like, I have to say. I don't draw many birds, and um, when I get into them, I really like them, but my, my uh, problem <laughs> when I'm drawing birds is... Um, I like to make stuff up when I draw. So when I'm when I'm drawing an animal or anything like that, I'll I'll look at it and then I'll kind of create my rendition of it. I don't necessarily copy it exactly. With birds, I find that quite tricky because um, if you're drawing lots of feathers, the feathers tend to be very symmetrical. They tend to be very um, structured in pattern. 
And I really, really find that a challenge. I struggle with that a lot. Um, you know, anything that's anything that's to do with maths, <laughs> anything that's mathematical, like structure and anything like that, I'm like, oh, um, you know, and, and that's why I love drawing fur so much and actually why I really love drawing humans, um, you know, because, again, you, you, you just kind of you've got the look and the feel, but you don't have this this huge amount of structure. Um, oh, gosh. So Vicky's now said, can you discuss sharpeners and how do you change the blades? Well, I'll tell you this. I've never changed a blade in my sharpener ever. Um, <laughs> if. If one of my pencils gets stuck in my sharpener, so here's a here's a trick, a, a, a tip for you. If you've got um, a sharpener like mine, a, um, a swordfish multipoint, and you put a pencil in and the tip breaks, um, do not, under any circumstances, put another pencil in or try and resharpen it. Just get it out straight away. And then what I do is I pick my multipoint up and I bang it down on the desk. <laughs> um and that dislodges the little bit of pencil that's stuck in there and then we're good to go um and then just put a graphite pencil in every now and again just to sort of resharpen it that's all i've done i draw pretty much every single day my swordfish multipoint touch wood uh, i think i've had it for about two years and i've never ever changed the blade once <laughs> um and it's fine and it works beautifully um so yeah I, so no, i am not the right person to ask about changing blades uh, I think they do have some YouTube videos, um, so I'd probably I'd probably go there. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but that's my favourite is the uh, the swordfish. Definitely, I think we talked about that earlier. Um, definitely my favourite. Okay, so just coming down here now, um, we're starting to get some nice colour in here. What I'm going to do is I'm going I want to just get a little bit more of this terracotta in, and then I want to introduce the India red. Um, it's really nice working with strong colours like this. Um, you know, it really, really is. I think it, it lifts your mood. Um, orange is, uh, you know, I think if somebody said to me, what's your favourite colour? Normally I would sort of say blue, but actually I think it's, I think it's oranges. I really do like the oranges um, in the colour pencil. And of course, one of my brand colours is orange as well. Um, you know, we were talking about that um talking about that today because I'm, I'm working on um had a big meeting today with the uh the, the platform provider that I use for all of my content um because we're, we're making some incredible changes um and she was talking about the the you know the the photographs the pencils that I've got and she was like oh was that intentional and I was like I can't remember it being intentional and Lucy was like no 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 it was definitely intentional we chose the colors to take photographs of that were your brand colors um completely forgotten about that but uh yeah so i'm just kind of going to come down here and then we're going to bring some of that darker color in around so so we're almost going to make like a little bit of a collar uh, around that and the um that's when we're going to bring the india red in which is a fantastic 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 color um you know if you draw sort of bay horses chestnut horses that kind of thing india red is the most wonderful colour to use. In fact, I would go so far as saying that I probably would use terracotta and India red rather than using burnt sienna. So the India red is here, which is 192, and it's a lovely sort of dull, dull red, like a like a dried blood red. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to gently, gently just come in over uh, parts of the um, uh, the terracotta in here just to sort of dull it slightly so we're going to use that glazing technique again where we're using very very light pressure just to bring that color in over the top and it, or, or what that's going to do is it's just going to give us a little bit more structure um, we're going to bring in some of those little sort of dark areas that we can see on the bird um, probably we'll probably bring a little bit of the um, cotton bud in there as well just to sort of smooth out slightly just going to bring a little bit into there so i think you know if you take anything from what we're doing here today you know it's about having a little bit of a play around with your pencils not being scared about using them um remembering you know, go back to school, 
Um, you know, remember when you were at school and you were mixing your paints and your, you know, your green and yellow, um, blue and yellow make green and uh, red and blue make purple and all of that kind of stuff. You just need to, that's all you need to remember for colour theory is just those very simple ideas about colour theory. You can go a little bit further if you want and get a colour wheel and, uh, you know, and have a play around with that. And then really think about your the pressure that you're using with your pencils on your surface uh, and play around with the pressure so that you've got the ability and the, the um, you know, you, you're dexterous enough with your pressure to get light pressure, medium pressure, slightly, slightly stronger pressure. Um, if you can, if you can be really um, agile with your pressure, that's going to make a massive, massive difference to your colour pencil work. And then the other thing as well is just be nice and fluid with your pencil marks. Try not to get um, really sort of stuck with, I need to get this mark in here and this mark in here. Because what happens then, it, your work becomes very, um, uh, what's the word? It doesn't have any movement to it. It just becomes a little bit stiff. So, you know, bring a little bit of sketchiness into your um you know into your pencil strokes and you'll you'll end up with some really really nice marks and nice movements uh is there a difference between no so there's no difference at all between pastel matte board pastel matte sheets and pastel matte uh, pads they're all exactly the same surface like i said earlier the quality parameters or the the smoothness or graininess parameters do change from batch to batch just because of how it's all made. Um, I had a really good uh, Zoom call with the the finance director and the head of production of Claire Fontaine. Um, uh, you know, just to sort of we were I was we were a little bit worried about some of the quality of the surfaces and and there was a lot of people getting really really bogged down and and disheartened and you know. Um, so I, they very kindly had a, a conversation with me over Zoom, um, which was amazing. And they sent me some samples across to sort of approve and everything, which was, again, you know, fabulous. Um, but basically the pads are, are pads. The the sheets are sort of a, a thicker stock, a thinner stock with a, a, a smooth card on the back. And then the, um, the boards are... Uh, a much thicker, I think they're about three millimetres, two or three millimetres, uh, much thicker. Um, but the surface is the same on every single one. Um, you know, but you might get super smooth, you might get more grainy. Um, and unfortunately, you can't choose. It's just, that's just how it is. Um, okay, so I'm just going to come around here a little bit. Um, I don't want to, you can see this is much more sort of duller around here. And I'm going to bring a little bit of the um, raw rumber into there. Uh, but I just want to bring some of this down into here and then again I'm just going to bring some uh, I'll probably bring a little bit of raw rumber down into here as well just to make it a little bit more of that sort of uh, duller greeny colour um, and then I'm just going to start to bring some little detail -y bits in here again we don't need to um, we don't need to bring all of the feathers in or anything like that. It's very much a case in this sort of an area just to get that like that look and feel really. Okay, so I'm going to use a little bit of a cotton bud. Um, just get a clean one out. And. So I'm just gently, gently coming in here and using the little bit of a cotton bud as my um, my blending tool here. I never used to use cotton buds. And then um, wonderful artist Judy Wysocki was, you know, was I, th I can't remember what she was. I think she was explaining what she was doing and she was like, oh, yes, I use my cotton buds and everything. And I'm like, um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. They are they are great. I mean, I, I kind of use a, a mixture of sort of cotton bird pencil, um, maybe a little bit of a paintbrush at times as well. But um, on the pastel mat, they certainly work really, really well. Um, right. Let's bring a little bit of that raw umber now, which is the 180. And we're just going to bring a little bit of that down into here. 
Let's bring that to a slightly, uh, again, sort of a slightly darker. <clears throat> Might end up bringing a little bit of brown in there as well, just to really darken it up. So again, very small pencil strokes. We're looking for soft and fluffy. So I might go round and round. I might go sort of backwards and forwards. And you can see that the, the sort of the greeny yellowiness of this pencil is kind of starting to come through um, underneath the little beak here, uh, which is really nice. So we're starting to get that nice balance of the very sort of warm, bright, orangey, reddy colours. And then that more sort of greeny, dully colour where it's sort of sitting in the um, in the shadow. Bring a little bit into there as well. It's really important in your orangey animals to bring in these more sort of greeny, yucky colours because uh, it just balances everything out. And then you don't end up with something that's sort of really... Um, warm and pinky coloured all the way through you, you do get some of the sort of yellowy bits in there so we're just going to come down here we can start to incorporate a little bit of the shadowy bits in here as well i'm going to come back with a darker pencil to to um, bring those shadows out a little bit more uh, but hopefully you can see that the um, this is starting to become a really nice well, I'm not sure I'd say, I'm not sure I would call it a really nice colour, but it seems to be the right colour. <laughs> it's sort of like a, yeah. And again, we've got to think about the finishing. We've got to think about how, how these feathers are just sort of coming off the edge there. They want to be nice and gently just drifting off the side of the robin rather than, um, you know, being a big straight line. And again, we can use, like, you could use like a little bit of a paintbrush. Where's my paintbrush? Da, 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 da. Oh, there it is. So we could use a little bit of a paintbrush. You know, just to smooth it out a little bit. You could use a cotton bud. Um, you know, you could use a lighter pencil in there just to sort of waft it off the edge. But we're looking for that nice softness on the edge there so that you've you've got a definite connection with the background and uh, the the subject so I'm just going to keep coming down here my um, the, the grain in my pastel mat is actually <coughs> excuse me is actually um, helping with the structure of the feathers a little bit down here so I've got some funny little texture marks coming through and I'm like, oh, do you know what? I'm just going to use those uh, as part of my feathers. So I'm just coming in there and then we'll probably use a little bit more uh, of that cotton bud in there as well, just to soften those. And then I want to bring some of the Caput Morton Violet in. So the Caput Morton Violet, again, is going to bring a little bit into the underneath the beak area here. And then just bring some of that purpley colour. I might have to just go and grab my water in a second. In there. So again, all I'm doing is I'm trying to shade rather than draw details or um, feathers or anything like that. I'm just bringing that dark shadowy bit in just to shade, just to give me structure and give me show me where that um, you know that big shadow underneath the beak is and on the the front of that the neck and going down into that breast area so again i'm going round and round filling that the tooth in and then i can start to bring a little bit more you see where we've got those little shadowy areas you can then bring some of those little shadowy areas in but without it becoming too structured um, i don't want big sort of strong heavy lines in there they need to be very soft so my lines are always sort of sketched they're all, um, you know, softly laid in rather than bringing strong lines in. I 
And this is the sort of work I think that is um, very mindful. Um, you know, when you're just sort of sitting and your pencil's moving around and you, you're kind of bringing something to life in front of you. It's a very mindful way of drawing. Um, it's a very mindful way of creating. that in there good okay um and then i'm just going to use that little um cotton uh, cotton bud again uh, just into here very gently so i'm not using pressure on it or anything like that and by doing this it's just gonna enable me just to smooth that out a little bit more and then I have to spend ages and ages bringing lots of layers in. Sometimes you have to bring lots of layers in. Sometimes it's you, you can't get away from bringing lots of layers in. But sometimes it's some, you know, you can use a cotton bud as a little bit of a shortcut. Um, I mean, we shouldn't really be bring, to be doing anything to um, to speed stuff up as such. Um, but, you know, tools are always there to be to be used, uh, which is good. Um, can I chat about the different pencils, Prismacolor? So Prismacolor, so there are, there are different, all sorts of different brands of uh, pencils. Um, and um, the kind of class, uh, I'm going back to using my uh, terracotta here. The kind of class does wax or oil. And the polychromos that I'm using here are, are, man are marketed as oil-based pencils. In reality, all coloured pencils have a mixture of waxes and fats and oils and all of that kind of stuff. They've all got a mixture of that. Um, so I tend to I tend to now call them hard and soft. Um, now, not all oil-based pencils are hard and not all wax-based pencils are soft. Um, so I call them hard or, or soft. So polychromos are hard. They're hard, dry pencils. They, uh, I'm just going to bring a little bit more of the uh, terracotta through into this bit here. Um, so they're very hard. They keep a point very well. Um, you know, the um, when they go down on the surface, they're... they're they're dry um, on pastel mat. They're a little bit. They can be a little bit not dusty, but you can move them around a lot. The the, the pigment particles sort of move around a lot. Uh, you then get sort of softer pencils like the Luminance and like the Prisma, um, and some of them tend to be more wax based, and that's why they're soft. But that's not always the case. Um, and they tend to be uh, sort of relatively opaque, more opaque than, than some of the harder pencils. Um, and when you sort of lay them down on a surface like pastel mat, sometimes they can actually uh, psychologically look like, or, or it seems like they're, they're bringing the grain out an awful lot more just because of how the pigment lays down. Some people love soft pencils, some people love harder pencils. Um, it's a very, very personal thing. Um, I like my harder pencils first, as a general rule, unless I'm drawing humans and then, I, and then I'm the opposite. Um, but I like my harder pencils first and then my softer pencils tend to be on the top if I'm gonna use them. Um, it, it, although it is sort of color dependent as well because lighter animals, I might use my softer pencils first, like a luminance first. Um, <clears throat> we talk about light fastness an awful lot in the colored pencil world, particularly if you're selling your work um, that kind of thing. It's very important to ensure that you're using really good quality uh, materials. And um, the brands that, uh, that, that I use um, and a lot of sort of, um, you know, professional artists use are Polychromos, Luminance, um, Lightfast, uh, uh, Pablo's, uh, people do use Prisma. Um, and they all tend to have that that sort of stronger light fastness. Um, not all polychromos are light fast. Some of them aren't. You can tell with the little stars on here. This is this is a, a highly light fast pencil. Um, Prismas they do have some of the problems with the more fugitive colours. 
if you want really, really, really top quality pencils, then you go for Derwent Lightfast and you go for Caran d'Ache Luminance. Those, are, those pencils are 100% Lightfast. Um, you've also got to really look after your um, paint, you know, your drawing once you've uh, hung it on the wall. Uh, you've got to be careful about where you hang it, etc., etc. So um, it, it's very much... Um, a personal thing as to what pencils you like to use. Many people, I've got my um, cap at Morton Violet here and I'm just going back in and just darkening some of these little areas in here. Um, many people love Prisma. <clears throat> I have to admit, I've just started to use Prisma a little bit more, uh, particularly on drafting film for uh, human portraits. I really, really, really liked them. Um, the quality isn't as good as um, polychromos and um, luminance and pablos the, the quality isn't there um, but uh, they lay down absolutely amazingly on drafting film they, they really are I mean they were such a joy to use they really were but then of course we have the problem with some of the light fastness with some of the colors so you do have to be aware of that you do have to be careful um, but it's completely up to you. Some people use, uh, you know, the the, the, the the pencils that are on more of a, a sort of a budget. Um, the uh, Castle Arts are, are pretty good. Um, they don't have light fast ratings, but, you know, if you're just sort of starting out on a budget, they're pretty good. Um, I don't rate the Arteza pencils. I've, I've tested them and I don't rate them. I don't like them. Um, and I also uh, rate on a more budget pencil, the Lyra Polycolor, they're a, they're another good good brand. The nice thing about the Lyra Polycolor is that they sell them in singles, so you don't have to buy a full set. And that's the other really good thing about um, the the quality pencils that I use. You can buy them in single pencils, which means that you know if you use certain ones most of the time or a lot of the time, you can then um, just replace the single ones rather than having to buy a full set, which I think is a I think it's definitely something to have a think about, you know, if you're going to be using coloured pencils, if you can buy them in singles, it's really important um, because you don't want to, have, you know, you don't want to have to be buying a full set every time you, um, you know, you do that. So, um, yeah, now I'm using my Caput Morton Violet here uh, and we're just sort of bringing in the darker colours through in here. And... Um, so that we're going to have, when we finish, we're going to have quite a nice little uh, sort of study here of the head, I think. I think he's going to look quite nice, you know, rather than doing, um, you know, getting the whole thing finished. Uh, so again, I'm kind of, I'm kind of coming around and sort of following those feathers, but it, it's much more a sort of solid colour and blending rather than, um, you know, trying to get all of those tiny little details in. And I think, you know, it's, I think it just gives it a really nice quality. You can, of course, go, go crazy with your details. No problem with that at all. Um, you know, you might be somebody who, who really, really loves that kind of thing. And you just want to get every single tiny little bit of detail in there. Um, you know, and I would never, ever take that away from somebody. I'd always sort of suggest, yeah, definitely. Um, am I using a magnifying glass? No, I'm not. However, <laughs> I have my special glasses on. <laughs> um, uh, my glasses are very focal and I have to say uh, they're one of the best things that I've ever got they're, they're prescription glasses um, it did take me a little bit of um, a little while to get used to them when I first got them and I don't use them for reading and stuff I only use them for my drawing but the bottom part of my glasses are, are, are magnified they're, they're sort of quite highly magnified um so if i want to kind of um if i want to get quite in close with, to my drawing i look right down at the bottom of my glasses and then i can actually uh, look through the middle of my glasses when i'm looking at my ipad and then if i sit back i can look through the top of my glasses and then i can you know so everything's always in focus but it did take me quite a long time to get used to them i have to say they are amazing that they were a little bit of a game changer for me because um, it, it me because you know if I have them very very magnified, then if I sit back because I sit back quite a lot when I'm I've got a chair that that leans right back. Um, I'm leaning back now, um, and um, I'd like to sit back and I like to kind of have a look at the overall picture. Um, 
and it, if I got my normal reading glasses on, I wouldn't be able to see or I'd have to kind of peep over the top of them or something like that. So having very focal glasses has been a real game changer for me. Um, it really, really has. It's, it, it's helped a huge amount because, of course, as you get older, you, you know, your eyes get worse. Um, you know, I never used to have to wear glasses and now, yeah, <laughs> I tend to wear them nearly all of the time. And, and actually, it's funny, I, I've become... I feel more uh, confident with my glasses and glasses on, particularly when I have my photograph taken and everything. I like my I like my glasses on. I don't know whether it's because I'm kind of hiding behind the enormous frames that I've got, but um, you know I do quite like using them. Um, right, let's bring a little bit more of the terracotta in over the top of the um, caput mortem violet again, light over dark. Um, through here I want to use a little bit of red in there as well just to uh, kind of richen that colour in there <clears throat> okay so if you wanted to draw a background uh, what would I do so if I wanted to draw a background I'd use my polychromos um, and um, uh, uh, just very gently and I'd use my cotton bud in there uh, for, for me, I don't use anything other than coloured pencils and that works really, really nicely. And then we've got somebody saying, why are we drawing so small? Well, because if we were drawing massive, we wouldn't get as much done. Um, and actually, if you were going to draw a robin and you wanted to draw your own robin, this is sort of like three inches. So it's not it's not that small. It's actually bigger than an actual robin. It's bigger than life size. But if you were to draw a robin, you'd probably draw it quite small. You wouldn't draw it massive. Um, you know, and I, and I want to be able to sort of uh, get as much done as possible. If we'd done it really huge, um, you know, we'd be stuck on the beak all night and, you know, we wanted to get kind of get into this. So, um, yeah, actually, it's not that it's not that small, to be honest. Um, it's just birds are small. <laughs> They've got small features. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where we're drawing this. Um when it when using hot press, does it must it be hundred percent cotton? So usually the the usually the hot press papers are hundred percent cotton. Um, I don't know of anybody any that aren't actually. Um, I think it's more of how they're made. Um, you, you know, because some hot press papers have got more texture and stuff in than others. And that's when it or, you know, that or it might have some kind of a they call it size, don't they? They might have a size on it, which is like a coating on one side, which can actually probably be very beneficial for watercolour, but maybe not very, very beneficial for, um, you know, for coloured pencils. Right. I'm just going to come up onto the top bit here on the top of the head so that we've got a nice little study. And I'm going to use my uh, warm grey two. Um the 271 and we're just going to bring a little bit of that onto the um, neck area here and then I want to bring some of the cool grey in um, in there I'm just going to just gently soften off that little head there as well oops sorry let me just put that on Um, yeah, and then I'm going to use my cold grey two, cold grey two, which is the two three one. And we're just going to bring a little bit of that cooler grey in here. So I like to mix my cool and warm greys. I think it's a really nice thing to do, and it and it actually gives a really lovely effect. Um, this is a little bit cooler. Hopefully, you can see it's a little bit cooler on the photograph. It's a little bit more bluey. Sometimes it's, um, you know, I get a lot of questions. How do I tell the difference between what's what's cool and what's warm? Um, and there's a brilliant little book that I recommend. It's called What is Colour? And it's colour spelled C-O-L-O-R. What is colour? And there's some, it's a very... Um, it's very simple colour theory in that book and it talks about warm and cool colours. You can get into like such a huge amount of technical stuff 
with warm and cool and all of that kind of stuff because basically you've got warm and cool colors over all of the different colors um but i tend to see them as um if you look at these two colors here i've got warm gray two on the left and i've got cold gray two on the right the one on the left looks more yellowy and the one on the right looks more blue and that's basically when i'm looking at a photograph that's what i'm looking at can i see kind of bluey purpley bits or can I see something that's more warmer, yellowy? Um, and that's when I'll kind of go, right, I'm going to use, you know, my cools or my warms or whatever. Um, and uh, that when you first start out, that's a really good way to recognise them. I'm just going to come back in again with my raw umber and just going to sort of pick out a few more bits in here. Now, I did say that we wouldn't, we wouldn't finish, and I hope that you're not uh, disappointed that we haven't sort of rushed through and, and, and tried to get it all finished. What I've tried to do is just give you as much information as I possibly can, um, you know, in this time that we've got together so that you can, you know, it's going to be really useful for you. Um, and that's kind of my, my aim really is to just give as much info as possible to, to help you. And then hopefully you'll be able to go and, and work on the, on the rest of the, um, the rest of the robin on your own now i know probably some of you are looking at and going well hang on a second we've done that with a little bit of the head and the bit of there and what about all of those flipping feathers bonnie with all of the flipping details what 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 are we going to do there then <laughs> um you know and it's this sort of bit here where they look like it's sort of cross hatching and that's exactly what you would do it's just cross hatching. So if we start off with our cold grey too, and I'll just we'll just do a little bit of a demo so that you can go away and you feel a little bit more confident. So we're going to start off with our cold grey too because it is quite a coolish area in here, and we're just going to just almost like we're drawing each feather se separately individually. We're just going to kind of bring single pencil strokes in. Um, I like to keep things really simple you know i'm not i'm not you know i'm not a stupid person i'm not i'm not thick unless it comes to maths you know i'm i i you know i got my exams and everything and i'm not stupid but i really like to keep things simple i don't like complicated things at all so when it comes to drawing something like this draw just what's in front of you if you recognize it as cross hatching or you know um noughts and crosses or I drew, drew an elephant I drew an elephant and all of the creases in it I'm just like the noughts and crosses that's all they are it's just noughts and crosses and if you just start to recognize your shaping and don't overthink stuff you, you're actually going to find that the majority of the pieces that you draw have just got simple shapes in them that you can you know build up gradually um, I think the problem lies a lot of the time in that we feel we have to go right hang on a second I've got all of these I've got to draw this dark line here I've got to draw this line here I've got to and then we start to actually physically try and copy exactly what's on the photograph by following each of the little tiny lines and that's where it starts to get like so 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 overwhelming and if you follow any of the you know the really top 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 color pencil artists i'm talking the lights of heather rooney i'm talking um gosh who was that the person i can't remember her name heather rooney in particular oh, oh my goodness her work is just extraordinarily amazing um if you go and look at some of her work you'll see where she draws texture She's not she's not going in and drawing all of the tiny details from scratch. She builds it up by building um, texture, by building patterns, by going, right, hang on a second. I'm drawing a stripy shirt here. Am I going to draw all of the tiny bits or am I just going to draw stripes and then do something over the top and then layer over the top of that? And then, hey, presto, there's a striped shirt. And that's exactly what we're doing here with this little Robin's um, wing area here. We're just looking at the texture. We're looking at the pattern. And we're going, how can I build that up? How can I make this work for me? So it's actually going to do what I want it to do. So we start off with the cold grey. Uh, I'm then going to use the warm grey, but actually the warm grey for, if I was doing this for real, I'd pick a um, probably a, a cold grey for, or even, uh, even a dark indigo or something like that, because it is quite bluey. Um, so I come in with a slightly darker 
uh, colour. And I just start to bring a little bit of that texture in. Again, it's just like, you know, wafty bits of, of fur. Um, just nice and gently. And then we get into this area here where we've got all of these sort of little um, lines and everything. And this is where I think where people just go, oh my goodness, oh my, I do, oh, it's too much. And actually, all it is is lines. It's just lines. <laughs> we don't have to have it exact. So we can just draw, um, we can just draw some lines in here. Just draw some lines in there. And then we can just draw some lines going the other way. And then we just build it up a little bit and we build it up a little bit. And hey, presto, you have a ton of robin feathers, which haven't taken you, you know, 365 more days to finish them because you're trying to draw every single little tiny detail. They've actually taken you probably about an hour. <laughs> And then you're like, woohoo, I've drawn some feathers. They don't have to be complicated. So my my urge for you for the rest of the year, hopefully you'll be joining me again on, on January the 1st, where we're drawing a deer. Uh, and I'm actually doing it on a darker, uh, a dark coloured surface because I really, really want to concentrate on um, uh, lights and darks. Um, but what I want you to take for the rest of this year, and we've only got sort of like a little a little time uh, left, is the fact that don't overwhelm yourself. Don't overcomplicate things. Try and make things easier than what you think they are. Um, you know, look where you can bring in things like just texture and lines and all of that kind of stuff. Then when you, once you've got these in, you can then go, oh, I want that bit a little bit lighter. So I'm just going to bring my putty eraser in and I'll just lighten that little bit up there. Oh, I, actually, I need that little bit in there a little bit darker. So then I can start to kind of tweak and bring like a little bit of a darker area in. And that way we can then pull all of those feathers together. Um, you know, we can start to darken this area here. So if I was to use my dark indigo, which I have, it's not on the list, but I could bring my dark indigo in and I could just very, very gently just kind of glaze in my dark indigo into here. I'm still going to keep the pattern coming through, but I'm going to have that lovely shadow coming in there as well. And I can actually bring a little bit of that into that ready area there as well, which will give me that nice shadow. And I, I can, again, I can just bring some of these little light lines in here, but just try and keep it really really nice and simple um and you you'll be amazed you'll be absolutely amazed at the effects that you can get just from keeping it simple and not trying to draw every single tiny little detail um okie dokie so i think that um that is it i can't believe we've been drawing for sort of two hours um and we've drawn we've drawn a robin's head um Hopefully this is going to give you a little bit of an idea of where to go down here. Um, if you look at your the tail feathers, um, they're just straight lines. They're just brown with black lines over the top of them. That's all they are. And then the lovely brown feathers on the back here, uh, you know, just just fill it in, fill it in brown, first of all, gently, nice and gently, then start to pull out some of these little darker el elements, uh, you know, so that you've got the uh, you've got a bit of the structure in there. And then again, very, very gently, you can just pull in a few of those little lines. Uh, and then when you come to the little tummy area, you know what you're doing in here, the tummy area down here again, just go really nice and gently. Um, gently bring that colour in. Don't forget to, to bring that lovely dark shadow and everything in there as well. Let's just zoom him out a bit. Um, remember your um, remember your shadows. You know, remember where you need to keep your darks and your lights and everything in there. Um, and I think you're gonna you're gonna do an amazing job with it. You know, you can finish off the little head area. Um, you know, you could pull out a sort of a little tiny bit of the. Um, little bit of the lighting in there if you wanted to 
Um, you know, everything that we've done today, I've given you the tools to be able to go on and, and finish this. And it'd be so nice to see, um, you know, all of these finished. Where you've got the dark areas, go in nice and dark. You know, the little feathery bit down here. It was a little bit out of the, hang on, let's move him over a bit. A um, little bit of the feathery areas here. Just, you know, make sure you get those nice and dark. Uh, you know, where your darks are, make them nice and dark. But the white areas, a little bit of a white area under the orange here, just make sure that that's, you know, it's actually not white, it's quite dark. So, um, yes, it's all recorded. This has all been recorded. Um, so you, you will be able to go back straight away now and, um, and watch it back. Um, so I really hope that's been useful really hope that's been useful for you um let me just come back here i've got my hat on actually oh my hair's going to be all over the place usually my hair is so beautiful isn't it um let me just come back in in view here there we go um so i really hope that you have enjoyed that that you've got some really good techniques from that and i'd really really like to see uh, I'd love to see some of these, uh, you know, even if you just sort of finish the head area off or something like that, I'd really, really like to see uh, your robins. <clears throat> and you can use, um, let me just pop it in the chat, actually. You could use something like, um, uh, let's have a look, hashtag at Bonnie's live, no, not Bonnie's live robin, Bonnie's robin live draw. There you go. Oh gosh, I've got a cough now. Um, so um, yeah, again, it's all recorded. And thank you so, so much for joining me. And uh, you know, if you want to come and join me again, it's New Year's Day. Uh, I think it's two o'clock on New Year's Day. Um, we're gonna do another couple of hours and we're gonna be drawing a, a deer, but I want to really concentrate on lights and darks on the deer, it's quite a dramatic piece. So if you want to come and join me again, and you haven't signed up, do sign up because I would love to see you there. So I'm going to say thank you all so much for joining me. Um, this is, uh, drawing live is my all-time favourite thing to do. I, I I love drawing and I love talking and I love talking about drawing. So it's my absolute favourite thing to do. So thank you all so much and um, have a lovely, lovely Christmas, holiday, you know, however you celebrate it. And I will see you on New Year's Day. All right then.